And today we'll be looking at verses 8 to 12. If that background, Clinton's still up there, you may have to go back and hit the cross slide or the welcome slide, then come back to the sermon notes. And on that note, as I already alluded to here this morning, um, on our Hope to You app, you'll find the sermon outline, and we've got some really neat things within that sermon outline. You've got a place that you can uh, take notes uh, on your phone, and you also will find today that you'll have the scripture references uh, up there as well. You'll be able to click on it, and you'll find those. I know some of you got your iPhones out, your tablets out, uh, so we're really uh, a lot of cool features now that we're putting in place uh, there within the app, so we're excited about that. Now, as you're well aware of by now, uh, we've been moving very slowly and very methodically through this 11th chapter here in the book of Hebrews. And that's been the case because the subject matter is of the utmost importance. It revolves around faith. Faith. If there's one specific doctrine that we need to get right as a church, it is the doctrine of faith. It's one of those words that is loosely used in our day and time. It's thrown around kind of like the word love. Uh, so we want to make sure we've got good clarity on what exactly it is and how the Lord defines it. And we learned that genuine faith consists of three key components. Uh, faith is committed to living a life for God. It is convinced of unseen realities. And finally, it comprehends the authority of God's word. That is biblical faith. And each one of these aspects of faith are interwoven in every individual spoken of here within the chapter. And these are also the defining marks of every true believer who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now up to this point in our study of the 11th chapter, we've looked at three individuals in particular. We've looked at Abel, we've looked at Enoch, and we've looked at Noah. And through their examples of faith, we've learned three truths. First, in Abel, we saw that saving faith brings the appropriate sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. In Enoch, we learned that faith, uh, by faith we walk with God. That's how we walk with the Lord. And then last week we saw in the life of Noah that genuine faith always responds to God's word in obedience. And as a result of this childlike faith, three things happen. We become righteous in the eyes of God, which means we become in right standing with him. God is pleased with us. The Bible says apart from, what, from faith we cannot please God. And finally, we're able to escape God's judgment. That's what takes place when we demonstrate faith in the Lord. Now today we come to Abraham. And Abraham is a very significant figure in not only the Bible, but he's a significant figure in the history of the world. Abraham is the father of the nation of Israel. Every Jew can trace his or her lineage back to Abraham. He is where it all began. He is where the nation began. But not only is Abraham the physical father of the nation of Israel, but the Bible says he is the spiritual father of all who believe. If you're a believer this morning, your faith can be traced back to Abraham. He is where it all began. Now, as we've already seen here in the 11th chapter, acts of faith were already occurring before Abraham hit the scene. We saw that by faith, Abel brought the appropriate sacrifice. And then last week, we saw that by faith, uh, Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his house. These were individual acts of faith as recorded in the Bible. But what separates Abraham is that he was the first individual, the first individual who lived an entire life by faith. That was the driving force behind everything he did, his faith in God. No doubt in the beginning, Abraham was faced with the same dilemma we all face. Was he going to live his life by sight, by what he could see? Or was he going to live his life by faith? Those are the only two options when it comes to how you're going to live your life. There's only two. You can choose to live by what you see with your physical eyes. Or you can choose to live by the things that are not seen, by faith. And Abraham chose to live his entire life by faith. And for that reason, the Holy Spirit spends more time speaking about Abraham's faith than any other hero mentioned within the chapter. 
And in doing so, God is revealing to us what a life of faith is all about. What a life of faith is all about. What it looks like and what it does, how it acts and and how it reacts. And these truths that are found in Abraham's life can be found in the life of every genuine believer who's ever lived. Now this section here in Hebrews on, on Abraham goes through verse 19. And instead of looking at this entire group of of scriptures on one given Sunday, we're going to take our time and look at them over a two-week period. I want us to see and understand this morning the hallmarks, the fundamental features of a life lived by faith. Listen to what we're told beginning in verse 8. We're told, by faith... Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out not knowing where he went. By faith he sojourned in a land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the skies in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. May God bless the reading of his word here this morning. Now, the first thing that the Lord would have us to see about a life lived by faith is that it begins. A life of faith begins with a willingness to abandon the old for something new. Look at what we're told in verse 8. We're told that by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, not knowing where he was going. Now, most of you know the origins of Abraham. The Bible tells us that he was from a city called Ur. Now, the city of Ur was located by the Euphrates River in what is now modern-day Iraq. And during this time in history, historians tell us that this city was at the pinnacle of its existence. It was blessed with peace and, and fortune and luxury, a far cry from what Iraq looks like today. It was at the height of its prosperity. You could liken it today to what the United States looks like in comparison to the rest of the world. And we're told here in our text that God called Abraham. And that calling is recorded for us in Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Listen to what we're told. We're told, Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get out of your country, and from your kindred, and from your father's house, and and go into a land that I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now there's a lot going on here within Abraham's calling. God is making some incredible promises to this man. The Lord is saying, Abraham, out of your loins is going to come an entire nation. And I'm going to bless that nation. I'm going to bless those who bless it, and I'm going to curse those who curse it. That's the reason we always want to be on Israel's side right there. If we want to be blessed as a nation, we better stand side side by side with the nation of Israel. And God says all the families of the earth are going to be blessed by this nation because out of it will rise a Savior. But the first thing you must do, Abraham, is leave your old life behind. Got to leave it behind. Now think about that. Think about that. The Lord is asking Abraham to to leave a thriving society, to leave a culture that he's familiar with, to leave his job, his security. The the Lord's calling him to leave his family and friends. He's, He's calling him to leave his entire life behind in order to follow him. And we're told here in our text that Abraham obeyed God's calling. And he went out not knowing where he was headed. Abraham had no idea what the future held. 
He had no idea where he was going. He had no idea what this new country was all about. He had no clue to what all this journey would entail. He knew nothing other than what God had spoken. And by faith, he obeyed. And we saw last week, obedience is, the one, is one of the characteristics of genuine saving faith. Got to have obedience. When God calls us to follow him, what he's doing is he's asking us to rise up, abandoning our old way of life for something new, and follow him. That's what God is asking each of us to do. We're told time and time again in the Gospels, listen to the Lord calling Peter and his brother Andrew in Matthew chapter 4. We're told beginning in verse 18, And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, which is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. So here's Peter and Andrew, established fishermen. They had built their whole life on, on that trade. Everything they did revolved around fishing. And one day God shows up in their life and says, follow me. And do you see what following Christ is all about? Do you see what it involves? We're told they rose up, abandoned their nets, they abandoned their old way of life and followed Jesus. Think about Matthew's calling. We're told in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, And as Jesus passed forth from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. Matthew was a tax collector, and he's there collecting taxes. And Jesus said unto him, Follow me. And Matthew arose, abandoned his old way of life, and followed Christ. And we see that exact same pattern repeated over and over and over again in the Gospels. But the one who did this first was none other than Father Abraham. And after he was called, the Bible tells us that Abraham arose, he abandoned his old way of life, and he followed God. And that is where genuine faith always begins. That's where a life of faith always begins, right there. It always be begins with this response to God's calling. This is the starting point. And God is calling each of us today to follow him. But it requires you today to rise up, abandon your old way of life, and walk in newness of life, according to Romans. To forsake everything and follow Christ. And that price is far too high for most. Far too high. At least that was the case when Jesus walked upon the earth. Everywhere Jesus went, people would come to him and say, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus would always respond by saying, great. But it's going to cost you. You're going to have to abandon your old way of life. You're going to have to abandon those things that you're involved in. You're going to have to put me first. Are you willing to do that? And we see time and time again that most walked away from Jesus because the price was far too high. But that's what God's asking. If you truly want to follow him, you cannot claim this morning to follow God and at the same time hold on to your old way of life. That's not the way it works. Now granted, we live in a day and time where most people think that's the way it works. But that's not the model we find throughout Scripture. Let me ask you this morning. If you're holding on to, to God with one hand and holding on to the world with the other, are you following God? Or are you just stretched in a neutral place? You're not moving anywhere. You're, you're neutral. The first requirement to following God is letting go of the world. Letting go of your past. Letting go of your sin. Letting go of all those things that are holding you back, whether you realize it or not. It's what it takes. And that's what Abraham did. He abandoned the old for something new. And Abraham's faith was absolutely incredible if you think about it. 
He didn't have an example of other godly men. The Bible tells us in the book of Joshua that his father was a pagan, that he worshipped other gods. He didn't have the voice of the prophets crying out and directing him. Prophets didn't show up for hundreds and hundreds of years later. He didn't have the Bible to instruct him. All Abraham had was God's calling. And he heard that calling and he rose up and he abandoned his old way of life. And he followed God. That's the first thing that happens in a life lived by faith right there. It's where it starts. A person abandons their old way of life. Secondly, a life of faith patiently perseveres despite the circumstances. Patiently perseveres despite the circumstances. Look at what we're told in verse 9. We're told, by faith Abraham moved about in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So by faith, Abraham followed God to the promised land. And we're told here that once he arrived, he moved about this new country as a foreigner. He never had a permanent residence. Here we're told that he lived out of tents with Isaac and Jacob his entire life. Life for Abraham wasn't easy. Following God's not easy. Life was uncertain. Nothing was familiar. Things were constantly changing. Abraham felt like a stranger in a foreign land. He felt as if he didn't belong. Do you ever feel that way? Like you just don't belong? Even though it was God's plan, he didn't feel at home. I don't know about you this morning, but that's the way I feel a lot of times. I feel like a stranger in a foreign land. <laughs> Like, I don't fit in. I don't fit in. That this really isn't my home. You know, I just don't, I'm just not at home. I'm not at ease. But by faith, I continue on. By faith, we've got to continue on, church. Faith is not a one-time act. I think many assume that that's the case, but nothing could be further from the truth. Sure, it took faith for Abraham to rise up. Sure, it took faith for Abraham to forsake everything that he knew and loved and follow God into the unknown. And as great as that act of faith was, it took even more faith to endure the journey day in and day out. It took even more faith to, to walk this new life. Every day took faith. It took faith for Abraham to continually persevere despite the, the circumstances. For Abraham, everything had changed. He had traded the security and comforts of a life in a thriving society for the insecurity and the difficulties of a new world. He traded the luxuries of a house to live in a tent. Everything was different. Life was uncertain. But by faith, Abraham persevered. And that's what faith does. And that's what we must do in times like this, church. We've got to continue to persevere. Life has been hard over the last few months, amen? It's been tough. We're surrounded with uncertainty. We hear something new every day. Nobody knows what's going on. Our heads are spinning. We're watching the country just burn down. But we've got to persevere. It's what faith does. But what was Abraham's secret? How did he do it? Well, his, his, his secret was simple. The foundations of his life was not built upon the things of this world. Look at what we're told in verse 10. We're told Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham wasn't focused on this world. His focus was on heavenly things. We're told in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, set your affections on things above, not on the things of this earth. And that's how Abraham lived his life. He was focused on heaven. See, if you continually focus on the things of this world, the trials and the tribulations, the troubles and the struggles, then we cannot help but being absorbed and overwhelmed by what's going on around us. It's going to happen. You're overwhelmed this morning. You're too focused on the world. 
You're too focused on the world. We're focused on the world. We start living and dying with every little thing that goes wrong in our life, don't we? It's living and dying by everything that goes wrong. But if you keep your focus on heaven, if you keep your focus on God, if you keep your focus on Christ and his word, then you'll find that the troubles of this world just fade away. Now, they're still there, but they don't carry the weight they once did. They don't carry the weight. There's no greater cure for discouragement this morning. No greater cure for fatigue and self-pity and failure and worry and anxiety than to think about heaven. To think about being in God's presence and what awaits you and, and being in the presence of those loved ones that went before you, spending all of eternity there. With no more tears and sorrow and heartache and heart pain. Think about that. After all, that's where our citizenship is. We're told in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven. That's the reason we feel like strangers here on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for our Savior, the Lord Christ Jesus. Think about your heavenly home when things get tough, church. Think about what your eyes haven't seen and your, your ears haven't heard. It'll change your perspective. It'll change your perspective. Look up instead of looking out. Look up, church. That's what a life of faith is all about. It faithfully perseveres despite the circumstances. It never gives up, never gives in. Never gives up, never gives in. It keeps going. Just like Paul, you just bowl up and take another one. And the final point that God would have us to understand this morning is a life of faith provides the platform for the impossible to happen. Provides a platform for the impossible to happen. Look at what we're told in verses 11 and 12. We're told, through faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, Abraham, he's an old man, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Now, I think at first glance, it's, it seems somewhat odd that Abraham's wife, Sarah, is mentioned here in the great faith chapter of the Bible. It's odd, given her reaction to God's promise of a son. Listen to what, how she responded in, in Genesis chapter 18, beginning in verse 10, when God said, you're going to have a son. We're told, and God said, I will certainly return unto you. He's speaking to Abraham. He says, I will certainly return unto you according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah heard it at the tent door, which was behind him. Sarah's standing there over here in the conversation. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well advanced in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. She could no longer have a child. Therefore Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I become old, shall I have pleasure, uh, have pleasure my husband being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? I'm being serious. Why did Sarah laugh? Saying to herself, shall I indeed bear a child when I'm old? Is anything too hard for me? Is anything too hard for me? At the time appointed, I will return unto you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So Sarah laughed at God's promise of a son. Seemingly no faith there. No faith. But let's be honest. Every couple here today, if God showed up in your 70s and said you was going to have a child, you'd laugh. Some of you'd cry. <laughs> Got the kids out of the house, and here comes another one. Sarah laughed. She didn't have any faith. And she took things even a step further. She, she took matter into her own hands when she persuaded Abraham to have a son with her maid Hagar. She didn't trust God's promise. She was bent on doing things her own way, and we're still paying for that decision. That's the reason there's constant war in the Middle East. 
And that's another sermon for another time. Sarah catches a lot of slack for her failures in her life. But this was a woman of faith. She was a woman of faith. And she proved it, I think, by her willingness to stand by her man when he was called out by God. She stood by him. God doesn't call a man to do a great work. He calls an entire family. He calls the wife and the children as well. From the time they left the city of Ur, through all the danger and hardships that come along with living in an unknown land, she stood by her husband. Faithfully. Who do you think heard all of Abraham's crying and, and whining and belly aching when things got tough? You know, ladies. The wife hears it. Who do you think encouraged Abraham and ministered to him and kept him focused on God's task? It was Sarah. She was right there every step of the way. Behind every great man is an even greater woman. Don't you forget it. Know your place, men. I've told you time and time again, I may be God's mouthpiece, but Angie's the backbone. Don't you forget it. Don't you forget it. Sure, Sarah had made some mistakes. We all make mistakes in our faith walk, don't we? But sometime after these failures, Sarah stopped doing things her way and started trusting in God's way. Her heart changed. And we're told here in our text that she judged God to be faithful in what he had promised. She had genuine faith. And genuine faith in God does an incredible thing. It provides a platform for the impossible to occur. We're told here in Genesis chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord said unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. And the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto, unto him Isaac. Which literally means laughter. She's laughing now. But not in disbelief. In belief. And when Isaac was born, so was a nation. The nation of Israel. And we're told here in verse 12 of our text that this nation has descendants whose numbers are now like the stars of heaven, as many as the grains of sand by the seashore. Abraham and Sarah provided the faith, and in return, God provided the impossible. Do you see it? The impossible. You will always find the impossible happening in a life of faith. It's always there. Jesus says in Mark chapter 9 verse 23, All things are possible to those who believe. All things are possible to those who have faith. It provides a platform for the impossible to happen. Again, Jesus says in Matthew 19 verse 26, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things are possible for those who have faith. It provides a platform for the impossible to happen. All of us here right now have impossibles in our life. What's your impossible this morning? All of us here are facing something that's impossible. Something that you cannot accomplish on your own. Something that you cannot do apart from God's help. What is it this morning? What is your impossible? Think about that. What is that impossible thing that you're facing? Share it with God this morning. Share it with God. And then show a little faith, just a little bit of faith. Jesus says if you just show a little bit of faith, the faith of a mustard seed, mountains will be moved. The impossible will happen. That's what Jesus is saying. Just show a little faith and watch the impossible happen. We're told in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that God is able. Amen, Stephen? God is able. 
to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. And know this, the power that works in us can only be ignited by a spark of faith. Just a little bit of faith. The first three things found in a life lived by faith. You'll find a person who has abandoned their old way of life for something new. You'll find that person patiently persevering despite the circumstances. And you'll find the impossible taking place in their life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you today. And Lord, I pray that you find us faithful, Lord, because we know that you will be. And Lord, we just thank you for the encouragement that comes from gathering in your house with your people and, and worshiping you and, and listening to your word. Lord, your word is so beautiful. Such encouragement. And Lord, today we've seen something that we all need to strive for. Lord, help us with our faith. Help us with our unbelief. Father God, as we've already mentioned, we, we live in a time and day when we're not able, but you are. And Lord, I pray that you help each individual here who's facing some impossibility in their life. Lord, we all are. And Lord, I pray that you'll just uh, give the people courage just to cry out to you for help. And just watch you move in their lives. Father God, help us. Be with us, Lord. Lord, we commit this time to you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask that we stand. Uh.